They're fun. They're not fun to plan. It's a lot of work, but they are fun. You're listening to the USSC Briefing Room, a podcast from the United States Study Center at the University of Sydney, where we give you a seat at the table for a USSC briefing on the latest developments in U.S. news and foreign policy. We'll cover what you need to know and what's beneath the surface of the news. Hello, I'm Mari Kirk, Director of Engagement and Impact at the USSC. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we're recording on today. The University of Sydney is located on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I pay my respect to their elders past, present and future. Next week, Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese is traveling to the United States for an official visit, including a state dinner. This follows President Biden's cancellation of his trip to Australia in May for the Quad Leader Summit amidst the debt ceiling crisis back home. At the USSC, we have two experts who have worked behind the scenes on these sorts of state visits, one from the United States and one from Australia. CEO Dr. Michael Green was a White House National Security Council Director for Asian Affairs and Special Assistant to the President for National Security Affairs and Senior Director for Asia during multiple state visits in the George W. Bush administration. And on the Australian side, USSC Senior Economic Advisor John Kunkel was Chief of Staff to Prime Minister Scott Morrison, including during the state visit in 2019, which featured the memorable state dinner with President Trump. Their inside perspectives can give us a better understanding of what goes on behind the scenes for these sorts of high-profile visits. What's really at stake? What sort of roles do these visits play? Does this state visit make up for the canceled quad trip? Uh, But before we dive into those questions, I wanted to flag that at the end of the episode, we'll get our by the numbers fact from both Mike and John. Are you guys good to go on that? You can count on us. (laughs) Sounds good. So I guess just to kick off, I would love to hear your perspectives from the US side, from the Australian side, on the purpose of state visits, such as the trip that Prime Minister Albanese is making to the US next week. What are the expectations and do these visits actually live up to them? Well, I've, I've, um, I've, I've planned and, um, and much more enjoyably participated in state dinners and state visits. And it's where the um, president of the United States, the White House staff, pull out all the stops for the president's most important partners that year. And they're only a handful a year for most presidents because they're all consuming and they're special. And um, it, it's really a lot of pump and circumstance. We could talk about that in more detail, but it, they're fun. They're not fun to plan. It's a lot of work, but they are fun. I don't know. I think democracies maybe do pump and circumstance better because it's so rare. It's not a regular part of, of a democratic society or a democratic form of government. Public doesn't want their tax dollars spent on that often. So when they do it, it's very exciting. What do they get out of it? Um, these are decisions that are sometimes um, put forward by the president or the first lady who says, boy, I really like John Howard. <laughs> Let's do a state visit. It could be that simple. Yeah, um, I really like that guy or that woman. And, and, and it sometimes is uh, to say thanks. We went through a lot together. We want you to get a political boost. We want to showcase the relationship. Sometimes it's because a relationship is at a critical juncture. Uh, we really, really need you. And we want you to get as much face and support and world press attention as we can to help you make this tough decision for the alliance. Sometimes it's a sorry about that date night. Is that the case here? Well, that was the case with Macron. The French president got a state visit well. and it, it's it's not because of this um, deep and abiding American love for France. It's because of our, we, we talk about <laughs> um, uh, the French whinged a lot about that one and got a state visit. Um, In the case of Albo, and then I'd be interested in John's experience and his views, but in the case of the Albanese visit, it's a combination of things. Um, uh, It it is all of the above in a way. Um, By all accounts, Biden and Albo get on well, um, and and, and President Biden likes uh, the prime minister. Um, It it is to say thank you. Um, AUKUS um, is a big, big deal, and it's also to give a boost, and um, particularly um, at a critical juncture in August, the legislation in the Congress, um, uh, they knew that legislation would be coming to a head in the Congress on relaxing export controls for ITAR, approving nuclear submarine uh, technology transfer, all these other bits. They wanted to boost that. They knew Australia had some big budget and other decisions. Um, And it's a little bit of an I'm sorry 
for canceling the trip to Australia. It's kind of all of the above, but emphasis on the positive aspects. How about you, John? Yeah, look, I, I think the, there's a certainly lines of similarity with all that. Um, I probably just, I should clarify one thing at the start and then we'll get over it. But of course, the prime minister is not the head of state. So when you get to the formalities, it's actually an official dinner. But let's go back to calling it a state dinner because it sounds nicer. Um, I think in terms of the the purpose, it is to really afford a degree of status to a particular leader or partner country. Um, and each each visit will be different and reflect a lot of things, the state of the bilateral relationship, what's happening in the world at that time, whether one side or the other has a particular ask. Um, so all these things can sort of colour whether it's you know largely just a um, happy event or whether there's sort of complex behind the scenes elements that mean it, it's perhaps not so or perhaps even awkward in, in some ways. But in general, look, they are very positive in terms of relationships. Important thing to keep in mind, I guess, from an Australian perspective is there's a bit of a split personality probably in terms of the Australian public. They like the Australian Prime Minister to be afforded that sort of recognition and in terms of the alliance, but equally, um, you know, I remember when I was working for John Howard when he went in 2006, I didn't go on the visit, but um, a rather euphoric official said at the time, well, you know, you've just won the next election by the images that came back from the White House. Well, of course, you didn't just win the next election from the images that came back from the White House. So um, I think in case of Prime Minister Albanese, um, you know, he'll have elements of political advisors hardhead sort of saying that's all great it's wonderful but we can't get too carried away because there's a cost of living issues and there's all these things so um look i i think it'll be a, a very a very good visit very timely visit uh for, for the prime minister and the president um but i sort of come back to the world's in a pretty um difficult spot as well and particularly for the u.s president you know that he'll have a lot of things on his mind i think as apart from the australian relationship yeah I mean, yeah, that's a really good point because it's always these things happen. They're a snapshot in time, but it's in the context of everything else that's going on. I mean, and that is what happened with the quad visit as well. There were other factors that, you know, played into what happened there. Um, and obviously, I know, Mike, you've touched on this, that there's a lot of prep work that goes into these visits. I'm keen to get a better picture of who works on these things behind the scenes, kind of which parts of government feed into it. What is locked in before the visit versus are there any things in terms of you know discussions or major points that kind of happen in the moment or during the visit? And from each of you, I'd love to know how it touched on your role. So like when you worked for the White House, um, John, kind of your experience as well. Yeah, the preparation is massive. I was the, uh, the, the director, so a member of the staff and then the senior director, the top special assistant of the president for the Indo-Pacific. In both those roles, as the director, I planned, but didn't get to go to the fancy state dinner. As a senior director, I planned and got to go to the fancy state dinner. Um, but it's a huge amount of work. Um, the first stage is deciding who to invite. And um, not surprisingly, all the regional senior directors in the White House. And in general, State Department has much less of a voice in this. It tends to be the NSC. Um, huh. And, you know, the, the senior directors for Africa or Europe or Asia all... Make their make their case for their favorite or most important or most um, needed leader to be invited. So that process is a policy process, but there are important domestic political considerations. So Carl Rove, the senior domestic political advisor to the president, would weigh in and consider things like, uh, and I imagine it's not so different in Australia. The Indian diaspora. We really need to reach out to the Indian diaspora. Let's get the Indian prime minister or. Um, uh, you know, our polls show that um, uh, swing voters, independent voters really like it when we have a state visit with a leader who is a good economic partner. So there's a domestic political frame. And then the protocol office in the White House and the State Department get heavily, heavily involved. And that's where you see the difference between, as John points out, a state visit with a head of state, an official visit with a prime minister or head of government. And I've and there's a difference. You know, I, if I remember correctly, the state head of state gets a 21-gun salute and the head of um, government gets a 19-gun salute. 
And you, you know, and, and, and the policy guys like me don't know that. So there are protocol officers in every country who are good at that. But then there's the military office and the secret service, because as you can imagine, the security around these is massive. The, 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 the White House spokesman and uh, woman and the communications uh, office, uh, what's the narrative? What's the message? What are we worried about with the press? Um, you, you know, I, I don't know uh, yet if the state visit for Prime Minister Albanese includes this, but often you have a ceremony on the South Lawn with the the old guard, the Fife and Drum Corps, and the, and the, and the Marine Band and the Army Band. And so the the, the 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 musical units get involved. It's just a lot of players, and you you do not want something to go wrong. If something goes yeah. wrong, it that's the story, and. In President Bush's term, there was one state visit where something went wrong. It was three months after I'd left. It was Hu Jintao. Um, uh, he wanted a state visit. Um, politically, Bush and Hu got on pretty well, especially compared to U.S. China relations today. But but there's a very strong feeling that we could not give Hu Jintao the same state visit we would uh, or even the same level of treatment we would a close ally. Um, and so we put the uh, Hu Jintao visit in a different category. The Chinese fought it. It was very contentious. Um, and, um, and then it got delayed uh, until after I'd already gone back to teach at Georgetown and CSIS. So, but I still got invited. I was still, you know, part of the team. So I was invited to the VIP seats with my wife for the South Lawn ceremony with the old guard and the drum. And, the, and, and, um, and uh, in the middle of the ceremony... A Falun Gong journalist started screaming at Hu Jintao. And there was this gasp that all the cameras, all the TV cameras turned away from Bush and Hu and onto the screaming Falun Gong protester. Uh, a few other things went wrong. Um, the a military announcer who says, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the that guy, he he introduced Hu Jintao as the president of the Republic of China. So this almost never happens. It almost never happens. It happened in that case because <laughs> the Chinese side was being so difficult over every little detail and changing things. And, and it was deeply, deeply embarrassing. And I, and I turned to my wife at, at the beginning and I said, man, I miss this. I really miss this. The problem, the circumstance, the fife and drums, the cabinet all there. And then right at that moment, the Falun Gong protester started screaming and she said, do you really miss it? <laughs> and my poor successor was pillared in the press, almost lost, it wasn't his fault, almost lost his job. So look, sorry for the long wow. answer, but huge amounts of work. But a lot of that is the president, the prime minister cannot afford for anything to go wrong because that becomes the story. I'm sure John never yeah. had mistakes, I mean, that's a ever. Well, uh, the Morrison-Trump one was, I think, was mistake-free. That's certainly the truth. Um, uh, look, it's it's... I guess this, there's an element of scale here with Australia. So we have, um, and I'll talk a little bit about, I guess, our visit to Washington and then a little bit back in terms of back here. But basically these things are done out of the Prime Minister's Department. So Prime Minister and Cabinet will have a protocol and international visits group of people. but And they'll be working around the clock um, really very closely with the head of the program in the Prime Minister's office who worked for me and... Um, um, you know, she would have been in regular contact with Mrs. Morrison over things like, you know, obviously her role. Um, and then in terms of the, I guess, the broader architecture around the visit, the international group of prime minister's department and our ambassador in Washington and his team. So that that's probably the core um, as along with the, the prime minister's office. So um, everyone, I mean, in terms of visiting Washington, though, it's essentially all the work's done over there um, in terms of the actual day and the, the pomp and ceremony and everything like that. So we just really turned up. Um, my hardest job was to navigate with my own staff who would get to go because oh. if ever there's, I mean, I think we took about only about eight people from the prime minister's office and some of them obviously select themselves in terms of the your foreign policy advisor and the head of media and things like that. But there's always a couple of spots up for grabs. So I could be a very popular or unpopular chief of staff um, in terms of making the decision as to who gets to go on these things. Um, uh, in terms of, yeah, in terms of, I guess, visits to Australia, again, as Mike said, there'll be a there'll be a protocol roadmap and, you know, something that's probably 400 pages long about 
how these things run um, and very professional staff who who make them run well. The other thing I, I guess just to come back to as well is there's um, probably more variation in, in part because the Prime Minister is not the head of state, so there will be state visits where the Governor-General and his staff are involved in, in hosting someone. Um, we'll make use of different facilities, so it's not like the President's house, so you'll You'll use Parliament House more. You'll use Kirribilli, perhaps, or if it's the Governor General Government House and Admiralty House. So it, there's a little bit more, I guess, texture in in the nature of our system um, in terms of the different approaches. But I think, I mean, coming back to where we started, it, it basically is a lot of work behind the scenes um, with that overarching desire to avoid mistakes, so that you can basically accord this status to to a partner. Mm. And you mentioned that the um, President Trump state dinner was mistake-free, to the best of your knowledge. How did it compare to your expectations going into it? Well, look, I don't know if you can ever really um, conceptualise what your expectations um, were. I mean, it, it was the first ever state dinner in the Rose Garden. It was a beautiful September evening in 2019. Um, and it was, as, as Mike, you know, it's a full day, essentially. So the ceremonial welcome on the South Lawn, uh, meeting in the Cabinet Room with Treasury Secretary, Secretary of State, Vice President and others, uh, Oval Office meeting, which, you know, I've happily attended. It's just a very small meeting, which was great. Um, so that's all in the run-up to the, the state dinner. Um, one of the other um, really nice things is we had a little private tour of upstairs at the White House. So... Um, the President, Mrs. Trump, uh, the Pompeos, um, the Pences, and um, uh, Scott and, and Jenny Morrison, and Joe Hockey and his wife, Melissa Babbage, and myself. So it was a very small group. And the interesting, the, the, the thing that I most remember out of that, it was the First Lady, because she actually did an awful lot of work for that day in terms of the detail of everything around the dinner. Um, I think the first lady probably did the most work on that. <laughs> um, and she literally flopped down on the bed in the Lincoln bedroom, exhausted before we, we went into the state dinner. Um, we, uh, the only other thing I remember is we were all, we, we spent most of the time President Trump um, quizzing us about wildlife in Australia. So we all had <laughs> those crocodile stories and snake stories ready to go. But the event was amazing. Um, as I said, first time in the Rose Garden. Uh, we had surround sound, so we had military bands, military band on the roof, which is the first time that had done that, and they were a bit concerned about whether it was reinforced sufficiently to, to accommodate, but that worked. Um, uh, very gracious speech by President Trump where he quoted Dame Mary Gilmore, who was Prime Minister Morrison's great, great art, Australian poet. So, you know, all those touches were magnificent, um, and sort of crowned by the military band playing Walsing Matilda um, at the end of the night, where literally I had a very famous Australian sitting across the table from me just in tears, um, absolutely blubbing the whole way through. <laughs> it, it was great. Did you and hand the Prime Minister a tissue at that point? <laughs> <laughs> well, and we had, you know, there, there were the business people sporting identities, entertainment, science, etc. So... What came out of it was Henry Kissinger, who I met. Uh, I actually introduced our foreign policy advisor to Henry Kissinger during just before we went into the dinner, and it was such a nice. So Michelle Chan, who's back in DFAT, I said, you know, Mr. Kissinger, this is Michelle Chan. She's a Prime Minister's National Security and Foreign Policy Advisor. He said, oh, that's a job I used to have. I think we knew. We knew. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he apparently said that it was the best White House event he'd ever been to and Greg Norman said it was the best event he'd ever been to. Um, wow. So it was a pretty pretty magic day. And look, you know, frankly, for a, in terms of expectations, for a kid who grew up on a sugarcane farm in North Queensland, it was pretty special. Wow. I mean, you've sold me. This just, it sounds amazing. And I'm looking forward to seeing what um, tone this state dinner takes, because obviously it'll be different. We have a different president and a different prime minister. Um, and I think you've made the case really well for the unique role that they play in terms of what maybe is achieved through these sorts of visits, as opposed to what happens on the sidelines of summits and things. So I'd like to pivot to 
think about this upcoming state dinner in particular. So President Biden had to cancel on the Quad Summit that was supposed to be hosted in Sydney earlier this year. So this visit that's coming up is, you know, partially as you touched on, Mike, to make up for that slight, but it's a whole lot more than that. So I guess, what does the Albanese administration gain from this visit that they wouldn't have otherwise had in terms of host the benefits that come from hosting the Quad Summit? What would they are they maybe missing out on because they didn't host it? And I guess, what do you really think they should be focused on walking into this big trip that's coming up well, next week? Well, um, what Prime Minister Albanese and the Australian participants will get um, is the the glow and the buzz that John just described. It's it is a very very powerful um, uh, moment and a very powerful thing to go to the White House. It's so iconic. Um, in my time there, I escorted more than one person who was telling me on the way in to the Oval Office that they were going to give President Bush advice or a piece of their mind. And then inevitably, they go in, they look around the White House, they look around the Oval Office. There's an aura that's quite uh, powerful. And so the whole glow and buzz is, is, a, is a good thing. Um, the Prime Minister will also get um, the attention of the U.S. press corps and the U.S. Congress and the administration for a day or two, which in a very um, busy global foreign policy agenda is something, let alone in the sort of larger uh, political and social and cultural discourse in America to actually like be one of the leads in national news for a day for a, for a leader of a country is a big, big deal. That's why people are so nervous about something going wrong because you want the stories to be good. Um, it's something of an action forcing event as well um, because there's such a buzz, such a glow. My guess is for this one, the two issues in particular where uh, the president, the prime minister and their staffs want to use the visit to move the agenda would be first AUKUS. Um, because right now in Congress, some critical pieces of legislation um, uh, are, um, are, are being debated to transfer the nuclear propulsion uh, technology for the submarines in AUKUS Pillar 1 and also to relax export controls, ITAR and so forth for AUKUS Pillar 1 and 2 for technology collaboration. They're not done yet in the Congress. That was a, uh, always, I'm sure, a big focus for the two governments. The one problem there is that because there's no Speaker of the House, because the House is in, in, a, in a bit of turmoil, the legislation is not moving. And so that opportunity is a little bit now lost. Um, uh, but the other one is the clean energy transition and the climate compact, the third pillar of the alliance, as uh, the two governments are talking about it. Um, John knows a lot about this, but the um, Inflation Reduction Act in the U.S., industrial policy spending, is um, attractive to some parts of the Australian government, terrifying to other parts because it's very market distorting. And um, the U.S., the Biden administration's approach is meant to be friendly to allies like Australia, but that's not what they wake up thinking about every day. They wake up every day thinking about how to get jobs for Americans and how to get climate action and then, oh, by the way, allies. So a big thing for the prime minister is going to be putting Australia and allies more generally back at the top of that list. Those would be two big ones, um, which would be policy outcomes they care about. One that they did not probably expect to be talking about, where they'll get a lot of questions, I think, will be Hamas, the Middle East. Um, and my guess is, uh, John, tell me if you think I'm wrong, the U.S. press has generally been pretty favorable to the Biden administration's handling of this, but the Australian press, and not just on the right, has been pretty critical of the Albanese government. So I think in the eyes of the world, uh, you know, the prime minister is going to want to be ready to answer the Hamas question and address that in a way that shows Australia's on the right side of history. And, you know, it's been a bit of a mixed message uh, coming out of, the, out of the government. So that'll be one that comes up. And who knows what else comes up? The Taiwan election isn't that far off. Things come up. You have to be ready. Yeah, look, I agree with Mike. I think my, our notes are probably almost pretty similar in terms of issues. Um, I think certainly for a Labor prime minister demonstrating and having that demonstration effect of showing the alliance is in safe hands always is pretty valuable. Um, and that'll be, you know, I think uppermost, one of the things that, that um, certainly Prime Minister Alb Albanese's team will be seeking to demonstrate. Um, and as Mike said, I think the, 
the so-called third pillar of the alliance around energy and climate change and and the next, if you like, layer of um, cooperative initiatives as well as um, how Australia is to some extent able to take advantage of the US action but also uh, ensure that we're not sort of losing out in terms of um, investment in some of these things as well. So I guess what the Prime Minister will be looking at is the specifics in terms of how the Ameri- the American, how the Biden administration is accommodating its allies and partners in the uh, Inflation Reduction Act and other things. But also, um, I think from a domestic point of view, if he can bring uh, part of the Australian business community further along that journey um, in terms of what Australia is doing at the same time, then there's a sort of a domestic dividend uh, on that front as well. Um, uh, I mean, Mike's the the geopolitics expert, but I, I agree that some of the um, images out of Sydney in the, the last little while um, that have gone around the world um, probably concerning a lot of people in our country, but also overseas. So I think it'll be a uh, Middle East will be a topic that will inevitably where issues of tone and substance will be very important. Yeah, then I think, I mean, you've both touched on this, but there's, you know, so much changing at the moment um, with the horrific attacks in Israel, but also timing wise. I mean, there's looming winter and changing weather in Europe, which may lead to a breaking point in the war in Ukraine. Um, and obviously the United States is undergoing its own political tumult with the ousting of the speaker, and we'll see how that turns out. But I guess I'd be keen to know, You've talked a little bit about what both countries can seek to gain from this visit, but what can, like, I guess, what could get impacted by these geostrategic circumstances or either in terms of getting derailed or would that become, is that white noise and these things around AUKUS and the, you know, third pillar of the alliance, can that get traction in the midst of these other really urgent things happening at the moment? Most of the U.S. press corps doesn't care about AUKUS. So they're going to look to shoehorn some other story into this. Could be the Middle East, could be the U.S. election. And uh, the Australian press corps, and I'm thinking about the Rose Garden press ceremony, which I assume they'll have, you know, there will be one or two Australian, one or two American questions. And history suggests that most of them will not be on the themes that the president and prime minister would like to convey to the public. They'll try to shoehorn other narratives and stories. So we talked about the Middle East, that'd be one. You mentioned Ukraine, and you're right. Um, I could imagine, um, uh, uh, and this is the unscripted part uh, that the leaders have to be ready for. So I could imagine a question, uh, and by the way, it's the reason why uh, the Chinese and Russians don't take questions. (laughs) But I could imagine uh, a question about um, the Congress, if there isn't a speaker. I could imagine the prime minister suddenly being asked, are you worried about American politics? Um, I could imagine the prime minister being asked about a Trump presidency. If I were a mischief-making Australian journalist, but I repeat myself, <laughs> I, would, uh, <laughs> I would probably ask that question to see what reaction I got. Um, and frankly, um, I could see a question about the voice. Um, and it's interesting because my, uh, although it's a domestic, you know, obviously Australian issue, my, my guess would be President Biden would be sympathetic to the prime minister's position on The Voice and probably want to be helpful or put into context that helps the prime minister. In that sense, there is a great advantage to having a, a state visit or an official visit with um, a fellow conservative or a fellow progressive. So when John was working for John Howard and I was working for George W. Bush, we weren't at all worried about John Howard ambushing us or embarrassing us or saying something dissonant. And I don't think the Howard government was worried about George W. Bush. Um, And in a similar way, I I think that uh, a Democrat and Labor Party summit, there's going to be the political uh, sine waves or DNA is going to be close enough that you don't worry about that as much. But the question could come up. Um, I remember, you know, 2004 was um, was when Prime Minister Howard and George President George W. Bush Bush had a uh, official visit and a Rose Garden ceremony. And and we knew in the White House that um, that there would be a question about Mark Latham, the Labour candidate, who was, tell me if I'm wrong, John, but I think even including Gough Whitlam, probably the most anti-American Labour candidate in Australian history, certainly post-war history, maybe 
Maybe he doesn't get that, but he's pretty close if not. And uh, we told the president, there's a tradition with our allies, we don't comment on their elections. We, we don't, you know, and they don't on ours. But uh, he did, <laughs> as history shows. <laughs> Um, and, um, he did it cause he was friends with Howard and he didn't like what he was hearing. And it was pretty clear that the prime minister wouldn't mind. It's kind of unusual. I don't expect that, um, prime minister Albanese would fall into the trap of commenting too much on the Trump candidacy. That would be, um, surprising, but Joe Biden might respond to that. And then the prime minister has to figure out what he said. So you know, they're, it's good they're aligned uh, in their ideologies, more or less. Um, it's it's good that they like each other, but but domestic politics in both countries. What do you think about the voice, Mr. President? You know, that's that that's one where the White House staff has to do its homework and prepare the president to not make news. Yeah, and I guess when he gets on the plane, when Prime Minister Albanese gets on the plane to return back to Australia, just to close it out, what do you think? they'd look back and say, okay, that was really a successful trip or we, it was really worth it or we got out of it what we wanted to. What would that be? What do you think, John? I mean, I think substantively showing that Australia's got a seat at the top table and influencing uh, US policy generally is a positive outcome and whether that's on energy and climate related issues or you know, showing, showing that we're um, meeting the mark on AUKUS, so all those all those substantive things. Um, I agree. I'll just make a point about the media. The, the Prime Minister will, of course, take a travelling media team with him, and it's not just those set-piece elements where things can go wrong. So on a daily basis, you'll have to feed the beast, as it were, um, with press conferences and, and things um, like that. And that's where you know, it's pretty much open slather. So issues around the voice, I was, as Mike was talking, I was actually thinking, you know, there's part of the the, the Labor activist groups uh, or the left activist groups that will be want the Prime Minister to raise Julian Assange, for example. So, you know, there's, there's a few things that the team uh, travelling will be wanting to cover off on and make sure that doesn't sort of overshadow um, the, the more positive elements. Um, just back on the quad too, Murray, your earlier question. Um, look, I don't, I don't think there was any major fallout. I think that the, the downside around the quad not being in Australia is really, I think, the profile that the quad would have got in Australia. I think that what the missed opportunity there was to, I think, solidify the importance of the quad as a institution. And um, so I think, I think that was the unfortunate downside of that. Now, you know, the four leaders will have to work on how we sort of provide that sort of momentum um, in coming coming years. Yeah, well, it's great. Great point to close it out on. Thanks. I've really enjoyed this discussion. I want to shift to get your by the numbers, acts or stats related to these sorts of state visits. I'll start with you, John. Do you want to share with us what stat you sure. picked for us well, today? You almost stole my thunder, Murray, because I'm going to turn the tables on my colleagues with a quiz. Oh, no. so which which president of the modern era has hosted the most state dinners? What and counts have as a guess, modern? Have a guess at a number. What counts as modern era? Uh last fifty years. Duh. Ah, oh, boy. Reagan. I want to say Reagan too. Eight years, very internationalist. Lots of friends of the world stage. Loved the puppets. Would you? Uh, not bad. He comes in second at 31, but the winner is Jimmy Carter at 39. No, I was going to joke. I was going to joke and say Jimmy Carter because I thought surely he'd be last place. Yeah, well, if he was doing the same planning of the, the scheduling on the tennis courts, God knows much, how much time was taken up on the <laughs> 39 state visits. And your old boss had 25, yeah. um, George W. Bush, and, of course, President Trump, Prime Minister Morrison was only the second after Macron, and I can't remember whether he did another one. So he had. So yours more. was late 2019, right? And That's then right. when the yeah. pandemic hit. That's so, right. So yeah. it's probably only two for, for President Trump. Wow. Wow. So that wow. 39, Carter at 39. I am truly shocked. That's so fascinating. Thanks, John. And you know that he planned every detail while the Soviets slipped into Afghanistan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, how about you, Mike? What's your by the numbers stat? Um, 
23 and 0. I think I'm remembering 23 right. 23 is the number of steps on the portico uh, that goes from the White House down to the South Lawn. Why do I know that? Because when we were um, dealing with the Chinese government on Hu Jintao's visit, they knew that. <laughs> they knew how many steps there were. They knew ex they had thick briefing books. They knew exactly how many um, flags the other state visits had. They knew exactly how many Jiang Zemin had before them. They were ex exquisitely, maybe Jimmy Carter-ishly, focused on every detail. Um, why? Because in uh, the Chinese system, that propaganda, that image, that 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 face um, mattered far more, far more to them than the substance of the discussion. We actually, in the negotiation, traded substance for protocol because we cared more about getting some things done. And um, and then that other number is zero. That's the number of DFAT officials who know who knew how many steps were on the court <laughs> when we were preparing for the John Howard visit. Maybe John Kunkel knew the number, but um, uh, why? Because they didn't care. <laughs> they didn't care. Uh, they didn't. And so I mention that because I think um, for President Biden and the White House staff, and for Prime Minister Albanese and DFAT and PMNC, this is going to be fun. On the whole, it's going to be fun. They trust each other. They like each other. It, it's a celebration, despite all the, you're hearing the PTSD of Mike Green and John Kunkel <laughs> in our roles, worried about what could go wrong, but it's going to be fun. It's going to be exciting. The black tie dinners are just wonderful, as John knows, the music, the the conversations, um, and um, even more than, you know, the state visit uh, or the official visit with Modi uh, uh, and then a state visit with Macron, even the visit of President Yoon from Korea, which went very, very well. I imagine they went into it not sure how fun it would be because Yuen was trying to pivot Korean foreign policy as a new president more in a direction that the U.S. Uh, would want, but it wasn't guaranteed. Um, this isn't like that. You know, there's there's not issues of um, great uh, disconnect or contention. Um, there's a huge amount of trust. And so I think, you know, 23 versus zero, I think it's going to be fun. And now I'm going to get an email from somebody who was in DFAT at the time who says, I know how many, and it was because <laughs> I'm not sure I got the number right. I think I do because I heard it so many times from our Ministry of Foreign Affairs counterparts from Beijing. Well, if anyone um, you know writes to us and let's correct you on that, um, I'll get them a cookie. <laughs> uh, well, well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Um, judging by the excitement we see over this visit, I mean, I'm excited just talking to it. I think we're going to see an even bigger response uh, with the next presidential visit to Australia, you know, but with the presidential election next year, uh, it's unclear whether that is going to be President Biden or his successor, whenever that visit occurs. Um, as we wrap up, I'd just like to point out a couple of other podcasts that may be of interest to our listeners. Dr. Michael Green is co-host of the Asia Chessboard podcast with June Blanchett, the Friedman Chair for China Studies at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. I'd also recommend checking out the USSC Live podcast series that runs recordings from our major live events and recent episodes include a breakdown of the GOP candidate presidential debate and a readout from White House National Security Council staff Kurt Campbell, Edgar Kagan, and Mira Rapp Cooper. You can find these on our new website, ussc.emu.au, or wherever you get your podcasts. Mike and John, thank you so much. This has been a lot of fun. Thank you. Thanks, Mike.